Everyone knows about the Chernobyl disaster, but almost no one knows what was hidden inside apartment 85, building 7 in Kramatorsk, Ukraine. A deadly capsule of cesium-137 buried in the concrete just inches from a child's bed. By the time investigators found it, four people were dead, and the Soviet Union had spent a decade ignoring the danger. This is the radioactive secret they tried to erase. Before the Soviet Union collapsed in 1991, the Soviets were making a mad dash to present a more prosperous image to the world ahead of the 1980 Summer Olympics, hosted in Moscow. As the Olympics drew closer, entire towns were constructed from scratch. The materials for those towns came from quarries like this one, and from exhausted workers under immense pressure, workers liable to make mistakes. Cesium-137 is an intensely radioactive isotope. It's infamous as the chief contaminant in the Chernobyl and Fukushima exclusion zones. But in small amounts, it has far more benign uses. Powering atomic clocks, calibrating Geiger counters, sterilizing food and medical tools, and even treating cancer. In one Soviet quarry in the late 1970s, a capsule of cesium-137 was used in a nuclear gauge, a device that measures the thickness of compacted materials like soil and asphalt. These gauges function like X-ray machines, but instead of producing an image, they measure the depth or density of materials. The radiation source housed in a shielded rod is lowered into the material. When not in use, it's supposed to remain securely locked inside the gauge. But the Olympics were fast approaching. The Soviet Union had a show to put on. Any work stoppage in the quarries meant someone would be held accountable. Tickets would be written. Careers, or worse, would be on the line. Under this pressure, sometime in the late 1970s, a capsule of cesium-137 fell out of a radiation gauge. The loss was reported, and the news reportedly traveled all the way up to Leonid Brezhnev himself, the general secretary of the Communist Party. He forbade any pause in construction. The Olympics would go on with or without that missing radioactive capsule. A week later, the search was officially called off, but the capsule hadn't vanished. It was right there the whole time, buried in a massive pile of gravel, a nuclear needle in a haystack. That haystack would soon become Building 7 in the city of Kramatorsk, eastern Ukraine. Residents were thrilled. The Communist Party had delivered on its Olympic promise and built something modern and comfortable for the region. It was now the early 1980s. Over the next nine years, two families would live in Unit 85 of Building 7. Both had children, and both families placed their children's beds against the same wall in the same room, the very wall where that capsule of cesium lay waiting, silently encased in concrete. The first family moved into the building in 1981, a mother, her 18-year-old daughter, and her 16-year-old son. The daughter didn't survive the year. Her brother died a year later. Their mother followed soon after. All were killed by leukemia, a form of blood cancer. Rumors spread, neighbors gossiped, superstitions grew. Was this just a tragic coincidence? Was the apartment cursed? Doctors blamed hereditary illness, even as neighbors began showing symptoms. That misdiagnosis wasn't entirely surprising. After all, who would guess that the thing silently wiping out a family was a fragment of cesium smaller than a paperclip? Misplaced years earlier in a desperate rush to prove that the Soviet Union had everything under control? Back in Krematorsk, Unit 85 sat empty. The deaths were unexplained, but the apartment remained. Eventually, the city's executive committee gave the keys to a new family for a new tragedy. A father, mother, and their two sons moved into the same apartment. Once again, the boys' beds were placed against the same wall. A decorative carpet hung there now, covering an odd burnt spot. No one gave it a second thought. By 1987, both sons had been hospitalized with leukemia. One of them would die. Why were these children dying? Why the same rare cancer? Doctors still gave no answers, only diagnoses. But this time, the father didn't accept it. Grief-stricken and desperate, he fought for an investigation. Any investigation, for someone to take his family's suffering seriously, it would take two more years for any expert to listen. When investigators finally stepped in, they found what the grieving father had feared all along. Industrial radiation gauges, like the one lost at the quarry, 
use highly radioactive sources to see through dense materials such as soil, concrete, and metal. These sources, often cobalt, iridium, or cesium, are incredibly dangerous when misplaced, and they have been misplaced many times throughout the history of the nuclear industry. In some cases, people have suffered disfigurement, radiation burns, even death. In one haunting case, a man in Brazil unknowingly exposed his entire town to a medical source of cesium-137 taken from an abandoned clinic. In another, a man in the U.S. used a radiation source to end his life. Perhaps history's only recorded radioactive suicide. The danger is real, even when the capsule is small, and even when it's sealed, even encased inside the concrete wall of Unit 85, the cesium-137 capsule remained a ticking time bomb. This isotope emits beta radiation, which can be blocked by a sheet of paper, and gamma radiation, which is far more dangerous. Gamma rays are high-energy photons. Unlike beta particles, they pass through almost anything, including several meters of concrete. But Soviet apartment walls? They weren't several meters thick. Investigators determined that the wall next to the children's bed was emitting an estimated 1,800 Ronkins of radiation per year. To put that in perspective, that's over 2,000 microsieverts per hour. For comparison, the ambient radiation in a normal bedroom is around 0.05 to 0.1 microsieverts per hour. That means the children were sleeping in radiation levels 41,000 times higher than normal the equivalent of getting a chest X-ray every three minutes, all day, every day for years. These levels rivaled those found in the basement of Pripyat Hospital, where the contaminated clothing of Chernobyl's firefighters was dumped. And yet this apartment wasn't evacuated. The cesium-137 capsule had turned the concrete into a radiation source more intense than the exclusion zone around Reactor 4, and it was quietly poisoning families for nine years. But because the contamination was fully contained inside the capsule, the building didn't become an exclusion zone. It wasn't demolished, only the wall was removed. After the cesium capsule was found and removed, the wall was destroyed, but the building was not. Building seven still stood, silent, ordinary, unremarkable. The only trace of its deadly secret was the absence of a single concrete wall in apartment 85. As of 2003, one of the families who had lived there, who had lost a child in that very room, reportedly still lived in the apartment. When asked why they hadn't left, the mother replied, we still live in that same apartment. We couldn't leave the home where we experienced such tragic moments. She was now middle-aged. She and her husband were raising their daughter there, in the same unit, in the same building, beside the space where death had once radiated from inside the walls. We lived with that ampule for nine years the mother said bitterly. The father said nothing. He didn't need to. He had already said everything that mattered. Thirteen years earlier, when he fought to expose the truth and save others from the same fate. The grief that has befallen our families, he said, is immeasurable. Building seven still stands. Perhaps that family is still there too. The cesium was removed. The wall was torn down. But the silence around stories like this, that still remains. We'll keep uncovering the unknown. Join me. The next story is already waiting.